Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our final One Health seminar of the semester. Uh, we are so privileged to have an amazing speaker for you tonight. I think it's the best way that we could possibly wrap up this semester of seminars. We have Dr. John R. McNeil with us tonight, a globally famous environmental historian. Uh, I personally have read several of his books and am so thrilled to have, us with, have him with us tonight. I hope that you'll enjoy his presentation as much as you've enjoyed others this semester and look forward to having you back again next semester for our, our six seminars that we'll be having in the spring. So, John, it's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Reg. Um, so yeah, I'm John McNeil from Georgetown University and uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about a term and concept, uh, Anthropocene. You may well have encountered it uh, before. I'm going to do this from the vantage point of an environmental historian, which means, in short, somebody who pays attention to the changing relationship between societies and the ecosystems on which they depend. So that's in a nutshell what environmental history is all about. And now I'm gonna tell you what the Anthropocene is all about and uh, whether we should consider that we are actually in the Anthropocene. So uh, I'll begin with a little bit about the term and the concept. I'll explain some of the debates surrounding it, arguments in favor of the idea, arguments against the idea. And then I'll tell you at the very end uh, where I stand uh, on these debates. And uh, I should also say by way of introduction that yes, I'm a historian. Um, I've been involved for about 10 years in the Anthropocene debates and have been and remain a member of something called the Anthropocene Working Group, which is 37 scientists and scholars, almost all of whom are geologists, who are formally charged with recommending to the International Union of the Geological Sciences, whether or not that body should officially recognize the Anthropocene as an interval of geological time. So that's where we begin. This is a version of the way the geologists slice up time. You've seen something like this before, probably. The subtribe of geologists who are responsible for all this are called stratigraphers. They pay attention to strata uh, in earth, uh, rock, or, or, or ice, uh, and they slice that up and slice up corresponding units of time. And so the issue about the Anthropocene is whether uh, this here, tell you what, let me try the laser pointer, see if that, the, right here, the Holocene, which is the last uh, 11,000 years or so, whether that should be considered to have ended and uh, a new epoch or era in earth history to have begun. That's uh, from the geologist's point of view, um, what this is all about. Uh, here's another way of looking at uh, geological time. And uh, you can see here a bit more clearly than in the previous chart, how they divide it up into eras and periods and epochs. And actually there's a subunit of epoch too. But here we are in the Holocene, except maybe the Holocene has ended and we're in the Anthropocene. So it's been really fun for me over the last 10 years to interact with geologists and try to help them decide whether or not there is such a thing as the 
Anthropocene. So geologists have a huge stake in this. Slicing up the history of the earth is essential to what they do and how they understand uh, geological processes. But a whole lot of other people like the term and concept of Anthropocene and have begun to use it. People who are not geologists. So as I write here, one, two, a hundred uh, Anthropocenes. Uh, it's used by philosophers. It's used uh, by literature scholars. It's used uh, by archeologists and anthropologists and by a few, not many historians. So I'm now gonna explain a few of the rival versions of the Anthropocene. In fact, I should say there's so much disagreement about this that even the pronunciation is at issue. Some people say Anthropocene, some say Anthropocene. So the first set of issues with respect to understanding the Anthropocene is uh, how old it is, if it exists at all. And there's some people, mostly in um, paleobiology and um, um, oh shucks, I'm forgetting the term I'm looking for, but people who pay attention to very long sweeps of, um, that's a, here's what I'm looking for, sorry, paleontology. So paleobiology and paleontologists, they often like a really old Anthropocene. And sometimes uh, they would date it to what are called the late Pleistocene extinctions, which uh, Pleistocene, uh, yeah, you can see the Pleistocene here is the epoch prior to the Holocene, prior to about 11,000 years ago, uh, going back uh, to about 100,000 years ago. And in the late Pleistocene, a whole lot of big animals went extinct uh, most continents, not Africa. And those extinctions, according to some paleontologists and paleobiologists, should be understood as the beginning of the Anthropocene because those extinctions probably, we can't be absolutely sure of this, uh, involved a component of human action, overhunting. So that's one argument. The Anthropocene. And it's a confusing argument because the Anthropocene actually begins before the Holocene. So from the point of view of geologists, that can't be. But from the point of view of paleontologists, it makes sense. Then there's another old Anthropocene, but not quite as old, uh, associated with uh, William Ruderman, an uh, environmental science scholar at the um, University of Virginia. And he says that we should understand the Anthropocene to begin shortly after the beginning of agriculture. And his argument is that clearing of forests for agriculture, and uh, it, it was responsible for a lot of carbon emissions to the atmosphere, and methane production, methane flux to the atmosphere, resulting from rice cultivation, and to a lesser extent, um, cattle raising, changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere and changed the climate six, seven, 8,000 years ago. It's a controversial argument. Personally, I, I don't think he's right. I don't think it did change the climate to any appreciable degree, but um, many people disagree with me about that. There's some geographers, uh, Lewis and Maslin, who argue that the Anthropocene should be understood to have begun shortly after Columbus, when in the Americas, um, maybe 70 to 90% of the population um, died out as a result of a whole lot of things, including violence and disease. And that this led to a change in the um, carbon flux to the atmosphere, the chemical composition of the atmosphere and climate. And they like to date it to uh, one particular year, 1610. Um, I don't like this argument much at all. Um, 
The classic argument is uh, Paul Crutzen's. Paul Crutzen is an atmospheric chemist. He is the one who blurted out the word Anthropocene uh, 20 years ago at an international scientific gathering saying, the Holocene's over, we're in the Anthropocene. And he decided that being an atmospheric chemist, he was attuned to changes in the chemical composition of the atmosphere. He decided that it was really the advent of uh, intensive fossil fuel use with the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. And that we should understand as the birthday of the Anthropocene. And he liked the year 1784 because that was the year when a major improvement in steam engines took place, leading to more uh, coal combustion. But the majority of the stratigraphers who are involved in the Anthropocene Working Group prefer uh, somewhere around the middle of the 20th century, 1945 to 1963, uh, for reasons that I'll um, explain in, in a little bit. Uh, in fact, 88% of them voted for that as the birthday of the Anthropocene. Now, I want to explain one more thing about this. For the stratigraphers, the Anthropocene has to have a precise uh, birthday and uh, it has to be observable in rock or ice, a before and an after. It can't be gradual. It can't be stages of the Anthropocene. That, that would be fine for historians, fine for philosophers, but not for stratigraphers. It has to be a sharp boundary before and after. So that means compromise among the various possible birthdays of the Anthropocene is not a possibility for the geologists. So those are some of the issues surrounding the birthday, the antiquity of the Anthropocene. Here's another set of um, disagreements about what it is. There's some who are occasionally called eco-modernists, and this guy here, Stuart Brand, would be an example of that, who regard the Anthropocene as a good thing. Um, they see it as the culmination of the human capacity to use science and technology for the benefit of humankind and indeed the benefit of the biosphere generally. So um, they look forward to uh, a, an Anthropocene, a well-managed human-run Anthropocene. But other people, including me, uh, take a different view and think that the Anthropocene is unruly, uncontrollable, unstable, unpredictable, and not something to be uh, welcomed and embraced. Uh, and the reason I think that is because the human capacity to agree on managing complex systems uh, is very close to zero. And it seems to be very hard to imagine our species, nearly 8 billion of us, agreeing on how to manage the climate system, the global carbon cycle, the global nitrogen cycle, the global sulfur cycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To some extent, these debates about the good Anthropocene versus the bad Anthropocene remind me of debates uh, 50 years ago between usually economists on the one hand and environmental activists on the other about 
uh, scarcity in natural resources and whether this would lead to calamity or whether technology would solve uh, all our problems. And there are uh, a species of techno-optimists um, and another species of, uh, of anxious pessimists. So I like this quotation from Stuart Brand. Uh, this is the techno-optimism and the eco-modernist perspective perspective. We are as gods and might as well get good at it. So um, what is the Anthropocene? According to me, it's post-1945 and it's unstable and unruly. The key uh, reasons why I think this and the key components why I prefer post-1945 Anthropocene are in the basic uh, biogeochemical cycles. And here I align myself with people who um, are called uh, earth system scientists. And that what marks off the Anthropocene from the previous epoch, the Holocene, is gigantic changes in the basic governing biogeochemical cycles of the earth, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, sulfur cycle, water cycle, mercury cycle, etc. Another way to look at this as um, exemplified in all these graphs is to take a, a basket of uh, different variables and look at their trajectory uh, over time. You know, I'll need my glasses uh, for this part. So you can look here, uh, and these of course are approximations, uh, 1800, um, this one is Northern Hemisphere temperature, and you can see a big upturn starting in the 1920s, uh, an interesting little downturn in the 1950s and 60s, and then a radical increase in more recent centuries. You can see the population curve here, and that has a point of inflection right around 1950, sharp acceleration. Um, you can see approximately the same trajectory with respect to the carbon dioxide concentration. Um, and so there's a whole basket of variables. Some of them are earth system indicators. Some of them are driving forces from the socioeconomic system that show a sharp acceleration in the middle of the 20th century, right here. And um, this is uh, about 15 of those. You could find 500 of them if you looked hard enough. Um, and all of these variables had their ups and downs um, throughout the Holocene. Well, some of them didn't exist like um, foreign investment or motor vehicles. But those that did exist throughout the whole scene, they had their ups and downs. But what's happened since about 1950 is they've escaped the uh, envelope of normal variation within the Holocene and shot out in another direction. And that is why I would say it's the middle of the 20th century when we should be talking about the birth of the Anthropocene. Um, part of my reasoning also is because I pay attention, unlike geologists, to the driving forces behind uh, this uh, shift in the Earth system. Um, and I'm going to talk about two of those uh, in just a moment. But before I do, I want to emphasize that the Anthropocene should not be understood as uh, human impact on the earth or the biosphere. Human impact on the earth or the biosphere has existed for as long as there have been humans, 300,000 years. Uh, but that uh, is not, in my view, the useful concept. The useful concept is the radical changes in basic earth system variables uh, over the last 70 years or so. Here's uh, a different way of looking at that 
uh, basket of variables that in the previous slide was indicated by uh, curves uh, on the same, plotted on the same graph. Here you can see them plotted on uh, different graphs and it might be a little bit clearer and also divided up into driving forces in the socioeconomic system on the one hand and earth system indicators or trends as it's called here uh, on the other hand. And you can see a certain <clears throat> family resemblance among all these curves. These are sometimes called the great acceleration graphs uh, put together by an Australian scientist named Will Steffen. So I wanna look at two parts of this in a little bit more detail. Uh, and those parts will be the story of water and the story of energy. So uh, this is fresh water only and human appropriation or human use of fresh water uh, over the last 120 years. And uh, what you see in the uh, trajectory is a point of inflection right around the middle of the 20th century, 1950s, uh, and after which there's a steep increase in water use, which began to level off, globally speaking, around uh, 1980, but uh, not to slacken to anything like the same uh, degree as the pre-1940 trajectory of increase in water use. Most of this at every point in the 20th century, as at every point in the previous 5,000 years, was for irrigation. Uh, second would be, uh, in the 20th century and 21st century, would be municipal water use. And third would be industrial water use. And most of this uh, is taken out of rivers. Uh, all of it's taken out of rivers and lakes and underground aquifers, but uh, rivers provide uh, the lion's share. And uh, most of the rivers of any size on the earth are now dammed up so that their water can be used, whether for irrigation or something else. But the rate at which new dams are being built has actually in decline since 1968. That was the year of peak dam, approximately one new major dam commissioned every single day. And the reason it's um, slacked off since then is because the best sites for building dams are already used. So that's a, a look at the uh, 120 year history of fresh water use that reinforces the idea of uh, the Anthropocene beginning in the middle of the 20th century. Here's a little uh, look at the history of energy over the last 170 years since 1850, broken out into the various um, uh, energy sources nuclear, gas, oil, coal, hydro, and other renewables, which in recent years is more and more renewables. And under that all is um, wood biomass. So you can see, again, that the middle of the 20th century is a point of inflection in the curve, when the upward trajectory gets much, much steeper in short order. Unlike the history of water though, it stays at pretty much the same steep incline uh, into the 21st century. There's some blips along the way. Uh, these are the famous uh, oil crises of the 1970s here. And there'll be another blip uh, for 2020 because uh, energy use is down due to the pandemic this year. One of the incredible to me, incredible um, things to understand about the history of energy use uh, is this point here. 
made by a scientist at the University of Colorado, uh, Jai Savitsky. So according to his calculations, they're estimates, but probably pretty reliable. Uh, since 1950, globally speaking, humankind has used more energy than in the entire Holocene up to 1950. So that's 11,000 years worth of human history. Uh, and in the last 70 years, we've used more energy than in the previous 10,930 years. That is, uh, to my way of thinking, a uh, signal fact even if it's just an estimate, single signal probable fact. And that energy history is the main reason that the carbon cycle in the same 170 years has changed so much. This graph is a little bit hard to interpret, so let me unpack it for you. Um, so here's time on the horizontal axis and what's on the vertical axis is what's happening to carbon in the earth system. And it's uh, in flux, uh, and that's sort of this part of the graph. It's leaving forests, it's uh, leaving uh, the earth in terms of uh, coal and oil and natural gas, and it's going into the atmosphere soils uh, and the oceans. But the degree to which the carbon cycle is in flux, the amount of carbon that is moving from the biosphere to the atmosphere or from uh, the uh, atmosphere to the oceans, whatever the movement is, the quantity involved really uh, steps up right around the middle of the 20th century here. And that's mainly because of fossil fuel use, but not only, the rate of deforestation has also increased since the middle of the 20th century, uh, doubled or tripled since uh, the 1950s. So that's a way of looking at what's happened to the global carbon cycle uh, in the last 170 years. And one of the reasons, again, why I think it is appropriate to consider that the Anthropocene began around the middle of the 20th century. You may have seen uh, curves like this before. This is the famous Keeling curve of uh, carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere over time. This is the last 60 years since direct measurements began in uh, 1957. And since that time, um, the concentration has increased by about a quarter, from roughly 310 to 410 parts per million. So um, that's what a, the recent history looks like. This is what the long-term history of carbon in the atmosphere looks like. And this, is, this comes from ice core data back here because there are no direct measurements before 1957. So you can see there's a long-term pattern over 800,000 years of uh, waxing and waning of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And the lowest it gets is about 170 and the highest it gets is around 270. That's sort of the the envelope of the normal, not just for the Holocene, which is just this period of time, but for the uh, entire Pleistocene as well. But then lately, something really weird is happening. It's shot up beyond 270. And uh, as you saw on the previous slide, it's now at about 412 parts per million. And um, it's gonna be more by uh, March or April, and then it'll go down a little bit. There's a seasonal fluctuation uh, based on the growth of um, trees in the Northern Hemisphere of summer. So what's going on now is this near, uh, on this time scale, vertical increase in carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere. 
and is way faster than anything else in the geological record. It's a hundred times faster than the end of the last ice age, which is this segment of the curve here, which is paralleled by the end of previous ice ages over the last 800,000 years. But this is a steeper ascent and it's blown through the roof of what was normal for the last 800,000 years. So we have left the Holocene behind as far as the global carbon cycle is concerned. A few more debates. Um, we've done the starting date and we've done the good or bad Anthropocene. Some debates uh, within geology. Some people say uh, it's too early to know whether the Anthropocene should be designated as a formal interval of geological time. Because after all, according to the Anthropocene Working Group and me, it's only 70 years old. So how can we dignify that as an interval of geological time? Let's wait um, maybe 10,000 years and then we can make a judgment. That's one position uh, within geology. And you know, to outsiders, it might sound stupid, but you know, geological intervals of time are really long. So how can you say after 70 years that a new one has begun? Another debate within geology is, is it an epic like the Holocene and the Pleistocene or is it something bigger like an era? This is really of interest only to people in geology, so I'll skip over it. And then lastly, a lot of people in geology say, this isn't really geological science. This is driven by politics and by uh, activism and we shouldn't even consider it. It's unscientific. Um, but there's another population within geology that says, no, not at all. This is eminently scientific. So those are some of the insider debates in geology. Maybe more interesting to the general public and to you, unless there's any geologists out there, are the debates going on outside of geology. One of them is the term itself rather than the concept. And some people say, Anthropos is not the right prefix because it implies, they say, a shared responsibility amongst the entire species of Homo sapiens and that that's not right. Some people are more responsible than others for the changes that have brought about the Anthropocene. So it's not the Anthropocene, it should be called something else. And various terms have been coined to try to capture this. Uh, the ones that are most often in use, and they're not all that often in use, are the capital scene and the plantation scene. And the geologists never traffic in this. This is uh, humanists and social scientists who argue for uh, a different terminology and not using the term Anthropocene. And basically these are political objections um, because they want to recognize differentiated human responsibility for environmental change. And the geologists, especially the stratigraphers, just don't care about those things. And they don't think they should have to. So um, for some people, the rules of geology and stratigraphy um, shouldn't have to be followed. And we ought to be able to define this uh, interval in Earth history, whether we call it the Anthropocene or something else, uh, as we please. Um, and that's a debate because there are also people, including me, who say, no, if you're going to come up with a label for an interval of Earth history, you have to use the rules of geology and stratigraphy. You can't just invent new rules 
uh, for what the geologists do. But a lot of people disagree with me with that and say, it's too, too important to leave it to the geologists. We should be able to decide. We, the anthropologists or the uh, literary scholars or historians. And interestingly, there are more papers published nowadays using the word Anthropocene uh, in literature and philosophy than there are in geology or any uh, science. Interesting. Oh, I should explain what this means, GSSP. So in stratigraphy, to mark the boundary between one interval of time and another, you have to have something you can point to in the rock or ice. And it's called, usually called a GSSP, uh, Global Stratigraphic Section and Point. That's all that that means, something in the rock below which is an earlier moment of time and above which is a more recent interval of time. And these GSSPs have to have preservation potential. That is, they got to last for a long, 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 long time. So the geologists 10 million years from now can see them. That's also a weird way to think, but uh, geologists uh, think that way. Couple more uh, ongoing debates. Um, so in conservation biology, this is really fascinating to me. There are people who argue, we shouldn't talk about the Anthropocene. Let's not use that term. Let's not use that concept. And the reason they feel this way is because they think that it undermines the rationale for conservation. If the earth system and the biosphere uh, is already powerfully and fundamentally influenced by human action, why bother saving uh, pandas? Um, so this is actually a minority position within conservation biology, but it's an interesting one. And lastly, well, it's really second to lastly, um, some people object to using the term and concept Anthropocene because they think it opens the door to uh, geoengineering. So as you probably know, geoengineering means uh, efforts to manage particularly climate, but the earth system more generally through deliberate conscious action, the kind of thing that Stuart Brand is looking forward to. We are as gods and might as well get used to it or get good at it, excuse me. Geoengineering means getting good at it, uh, regulating the climate by, for example, injecting sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere to deflect sunlight from the earth back into space and cool the planet to compensate for the warming of the planet brought on by emission of greenhouse gases. That's geoengineering. And a lot of people, myself included, are very skeptical of geoengineering um, for a number of reasons. In my case, partly because I'm afraid it won't be done well and all sorts of unanticipated consequences would flow from it. And secondly, because it would invest tremendous power in the hands of a tiny minority of geoengineering technocrats. And um, you'd have to trust them a lot before you wanted to do that. So, Another possible objection, uh, and this is one that I'm increasingly partial to myself, is that the term uh, has got already gotten too fuzzy because so many people are using it to mean so many different things that it doesn't really mean anything. You could say by analogy that there are other words like capitalism that means so many different things to different people that 
it's hard to understand just what is meant by it. And I think that's happening to Anthropocene. Some people use it just to mean nowadays. Some people use it to refer only to the climate crisis. And the stratigraphers want to use it in a very specific manner. Uh, and so there are too many understandings of it. All right, this brings me to the end. Um, I'm going to summarize views that I've already expressed uh, in the last 40 minutes or so. First of all, in my judgment, yes, we are there now. We are in the Anthropocene. It has begun, and it began sometime in the middle of the 20th century. And if we have to have a GSSP, a signal uh, in the rock or sediments, uh, we could use um, the so-called bomb spike. That is the traces of radioactivity released either by the first above ground nuclear explosion, which happened in July 1945 in New Mexico, left a faint signal um, all around the world, which is captured and stored in um, rock and sediments. Or we could use the whole period 1945 to 1963 when there were something like uh, four or 5,000 above ground atmospheric nuclear tests, all of which sprinkled radiation all over the surface of the earth and left a signal that's gonna last for several hundred thousand years. Might not last for 10 million years, but uh, I hope a few hundred thousand would be good enough for the stratigraphers. And the reason that stopped in 1963 is because there was a, a so-called partial test ban treaty uh, and nuclear testing went underground uh, after 1963. So that's my Anthropocene. I also, as I've said, am um, anxious about it rather than triumphant about it. I think it's going to be, and it already is, unruly and not benign for anybody or any species. Um, but I also think uh, that the utility of the term, not the concept, but the term, is declining because the, uh, too many cooks, it has too many definitions, it means too many different things to different people. I regret that, but I think it's a reality. If the geologists formally adopt it, which would happen um, sometime in the next five years, the geologists move fairly slowly. They, after all, think in terms of geological time. And if there is going to be an Anthropocene for geology, they have to agree on a GSSP. And they're hunting right now for various candidates. Um, but if the geologists adopt it, I'll continue to use the Anthropocene and I'll use it in the stratigraphic sense. But if they don't, and everybody's using Anthropocene to mean whatever they want, I'm probably going to stop using it because it will have lost its clarity. If you ever get the chance, you should look at uh, photographs by a Canadian photographer named Ed Bertinsky, who has tried to document the Anthropocene as he understands it. And he's one of the world's great photographers. Here are a couple examples uh, of his work. I can't remember where I got it, but probably online somewhere. Um, and he's going around the world documenting landscapes that have undergone dramatic uh, human modification. Uh, so if you ever get the chance, uh, his photographs are amazing. So I will leave you with that. Thank you for your attention. 
and now I will, uh, with uh, Reg's help, try to deal with whatever um, quibbles, quarrels, or questions uh, you might have on your mind. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. And we do have several questions that are coming up, so I'll get to those. Uh, so our first question is from Phoebe. Was a brand publisher of the Last Whole Earth catalog circa 1970? Yes, the very same. Cool. And we've got a couple others from Phoebe as well. So could you explain how an ice core can be kept cold enough or stable enough in temperature to assay chemicals? Um, yeah, I can. So um, the ice cores come from either Antarctica or Greenland or a few mountain glaciers around the world. And there are people who spend their time uh, scooping them out. And as soon as they do that, they put them on airplanes with freezer units and they fly them to laboratories uh, here or there. Most of the laboratories that do this kind of work are either in uh, Europe, Japan, or North America. And then they keep them in a deep freeze um, indefinitely. And uh, when they want to do analysis of the um, chemicals or other contents of the ice, they, um, they slice it up real fine with a saw and uh, melt those sections and put them under um, microscopes or um, sometimes they're after air bubbles uh, and they want to uh, document the carbon dioxide concentration of the air trapped in bubbles in the ice. This is how most of the climate record uh, is acquired. And in that case, you, you don't uh, melt the ice and look under a microscope for, let us say, lead uh, dust, but you uh, instead capture the air bubble. And um, I must say, I don't know how this is done, uh, uh, calculate the concentration of carbon dioxide in that little quantity of air but it's done probably the same way that the um, calculations are done since 1957 on top of a mountain in Hawaii. Um, and there's no arguments about the reliability of this method. Phoebe also asked, uh, when is the next international geophysical year? I don't know. Um, so the only one I know about was 1957, International Geophysical Year. Um, and if there's going to be another one, or if there have been other ones uh, since 1957, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, we have a question from Claire. So my mind is considerably blown. But am I understanding correctly that it's the end of the world as we know it? Can we and how can we transition into a less unruly, more benign era? So this is a big question. Uh, and a lot of people think about it a lot. Uh, I think about it some. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, my daughter is going to be one of the people who uh, help us figure this out. Um, I'm trying to convince her to make her career in, in the energy sector. So um, here's why I think environmental history is actually potentially useful. If, as I believe, the reason we have vaulted ourselves into the Anthropocene is uh, primarily because of the energy system that we have built in the 20th century, the most important step we can take towards stabilizing the Anthropocene doesn't mean we revert to anything else, 
the most important step we can take is to change the energy system yet again uh, to one that uh, minimizes the role of fossil fuels because they are, are responsible overwhelmingly for disrupting the carbon cycle and the sulfur cycle. Uh, and that's beginning to happen. Um, in the last year or two, uh, solar power has become competitive on price with uh, every other kind of uh, electric power. And it's going to get cheaper faster than gas or hydro or uh, certainly than nuclear or oil. And uh, wind power is also getting cheaper really fast. Um, and in fact, the pandemic this year has shown uh, in some parts of the world that we can uh, almost survive on uh, solar and wind, that they can deliver enough power around the clock and around the year uh, to get us through. And the reason the pandemic has shown this is because while energy demand has gone down, particularly in places like Denmark, uh, when it does, they've kept using solar and wind and stopped using uh, oil and other uh, fuels to make electricity. And they found that they can get by uh, on solar and wind. So, and mind you, Denmark has more capacity than most other countries in the world, but it proves the point that it is feasible. Uh, so to my way of thinking, this is the most important variable and the most important task is to bring forward the day when we retire coal plants and we transition away from oil in as many segments of the economy as possible. It may not be easy to do it in aviation, for example. And there may be a, a residual sectors which are oil dependent for many decades. But in a lot of the economy, particularly uh, electric power generation, it should be possible to be 100% renewable. It's going to take some decades. And whether we have those decades before something really bad happens, to the earth system, nobody knows for sure. I'm reasonably optimistic that we do have some decades, um, but this is the most urgent task. Second most urgent task, I would say, is to uh, hasten the day when uh, population growth stops. Population growth has been slowing down since about 1972. And the main reasons for that are twofold. One is urbanization, and the other is formal education for females. So far in world history, always and everywhere, the populations have urbanized, they've chosen to have fewer children. The reasons for this are straightforward. Uh, in the countryside, little kids can be useful. In the urban setting, they're not useful. They're a drain on their parents' time, energy, and money. And secondly, formal education for female, females, always and everywhere so far in world history, where girls and women get more formal education, they choose to have uh, fewer children. And since 1950, uh, human population has tripled. That's a huge driving force behind the advent of the Anthropocene. And eventually that's gonna stop. That growth is gonna stop. The sooner it stops, the better from the point of stabilizing earth systems. And formal education for females is a great goal for other reasons as well. It's hard to object to that, although there are places in the world where, uh, where people do object to it, um, but not that many places anymore. 
So our next question is from Tanya. So what is the objective in terms of the language we use? Is it about a particular form of action? I imagine this is the case in the humanities and social sciences. Would you consider using a term like capitalocene or is this too agenda driven? For me, it's, uh, it's too agenda driven and it's gonna alienate some people who uh, would otherwise be on board with the concept. And I also think um, it, it has its own uh, intellectual defects. Here's what I mean. So Anthropocene has its intellectual defects, at least according to a lot of uh, humanists and social sciences, because as I said, it, they believe, implies equally shared responsibility for the turbulence in the global environment. Personally, I don't think that term necessarily does have that implication, but that's what they argue. But capital is seen, uh, seems to me, not just to imply, but to state that the crux of the uh, problem, the source of the turbulence is capitalism. The way I read the history of some modern non-capitalist societies, let's say the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China, which is officially communist, although some people would say it's, it's actually capitalist. But 40 years ago, it was not capitalist. The, these societies too contributed mightily to the turbulence in the global environment and they weren't capitalist. So for that reason, it seems to me capitalist scene is also intellectually inadequate. And the lesser of the available evils, I think, is Anthropocene. It also has what you could call the incumbent advantage. Millions of people are already using it. And as I've said before, that has disadvantages because it gets used in so many different ways, it becomes unclear. But it has the advantage of incumbency. There's millions of people who don't have to be convinced of the validity of the concept capital scene, plantation of scene, or some of the other scenes that have been suggested would require um, a lot more persuasion of a lot more people. So I'm okay with Anthropocene, although I'm aware of its imperfections as a term. Uh, later down here, because of your discussion of energy, Tanya also wrote, and thank you with your response uh, regarding energy, yes. And we have uh, one other question, and this is from Zach. Uh, what has been the greatest human caused environmental disaster? It's a, a tough question, Zach, because what constitutes a disaster? So could you say that the current uh, climate crisis in the early 21st century constitutes a disaster? Or do you need something more bounded uh, in time and space to be faster? Like say uh, the BP horizon oil well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, whenever that was almost 10 years ago now, I think, or the um, nuclear power plant explosion at Chernobyl in 1986 or the, the meltdown of Fukushima in Japan in 2011. Those are clearly human caused disasters. They're bounded in space and time. Whether the climate crisis counts as a disaster or something different is a matter of definition. Um, so if you allow the climate crisis to qualify as a disaster, I'd say that's number one. If you need something more bounded in space and time, 
Um, I'd say there are a lot of candidates. Um, and um, in terms of what it did to humankind, I would say maybe number one would be the, um, the great leap forward in China in 1958, 59, 60, which was a politically motivated, uh, boneheaded attempt to uh, reconfigure Chinese agriculture and industry led to all sorts of uh, environmental uh, consequences, the most um, direct of which was a large scale famine that killed 30 to 50 million Chinese. So if body count is the key variable, then I think the Great Leap Forward wins. And I'm just gonna do one more question here. And Maria asks, how about industrial ocean? Uh, Maria, as far as I know, you're the first person to suggest this, which is shocking because um, I would have thought somebody would have thought of this and suggested it before. Maybe somebody has, and I don't know about it, but I try to pay attention to these debates. And as far as I know, I've never come across that term uh, at all. But it has certain merits because um, it is industrialization that is really the, the, the key baseline transformation that underlies the rebuilt energy system of modern times. And it is um, industrialization that to a significant degree is um, responsible for allowing human population to uh, quintiple since about 1800. So in terms of a term that captures responsibility for the global environmental turbulence of modern times, industrialocene or industrocene, something like that, um, actually has a lot of justification but it doesn't have the advantage of incumbency. It's hard for uh, uh, any new term to displace Anthropocene. But if Paul Crutzen had been thinking 20 years ago when he blurted out, the Holocene is over, we're in, we're in, we're in the Anthropocene. If he had instead said, we're in, we're in the Industrialocene, then that's the term that we would be using. Well, I have one last question for you, John. Can you explain this parting slide? Oh, um, yeah, I just uh, like this one. Um, it uh, for, represents two different things. One is uh, connectivity. All these little lines represent um, connections among different parts of the world. I would guess it's... Um, shipping rather than fiber optic cables or some other form of uh, uh, connection. And, and the reason for that is so much is going through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea here. So much is going through the Straits of Malacca and around Singapore here. That makes me think that the white uh, illumination is uh, shipping and connectivity. And the size of the continents is distorted according to population. So that's why India looks so big and East Asia is distended um, and why South America is kind of small. It's um, resized according to population. You can see maps like this that resize the various parts of the world according to their carbon emissions, uh, according to their GNP. Um, and they're kind of interesting ways to help you think about the distribution of things around the world. 
Yeah, these are used quite extensively within conservation biology uh, to look at different kinds of aspects of uh, either species diversities or, or other forms of activities that are going on. Uh, James in the chat box had said, thank you so much. Fascinating and important lecture. And I, I must echo that. And I'm sure that all of our participants tonight uh, would echo that as well. John, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. It's a great way to wrap up uh, this semester's One Health seminars. Well, uh, thanks to you all and um, good luck. Stay healthy. Thank you, you too. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>